now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Robbie Erskine. Now, I uh, remember when I started my uh, consultant career in regional anesthesia, attending a talk that Robbie gave a long time ago about ambulatory spinal anesthesia. Uh, and at the time, I thought, I can't see there being any time when I need to use that and how things have changed. Uh, so Robbie is a consultant anesthetist at Derby. Uh, he has an interest in acute pain, ultrasound guided regional anesthesia, and in targeting spinal anesthesia for ambulatory surgery. And it's really useful that we have you here for that. Robbie, I really look forward to what you have to say to us. Well, thank you very much, Amit, um, uh, and thank you everybody for joining. And um, welcome to uh, to you all from uh, sunny Derbyshire. There we are. Right. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, ambulatory spinal anesthesia and why it's why it's a really good and efficient choice, particularly in the present climate, but also generally um, for the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the pandemic, just to mention it in regional anesthesia, but that's been covered already. Um, I'm going to talk about the state of play of spinals in the UK at the moment, um, and um, the evolution of short-acting spinals. Really. Um, uh, using uh, knee replacement as an example over the last 30 years to see how it's changed and why the newer agents uh, uh, really fit in uh, with this sort of surgery. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about how to do it because I think a lot of you probably want to hear that um, and why it's the efficient choice. So I work in a, a regionally permissive environment in Derby. It's extremely easy for me to do regional anesthesia. I've done it there for the last 25, 30 years. Um, it, uh, it, it's, it's, it's never um, a surprise when you do a regional anaesthetic here. We do a lot of spinals. I think we did about 15 or 16,000 spinal anaesthetics last year, just in our hospital. Um, my talk's very experience-based. Um, uh, it's got a strong European bias. Apologies to those from elsewhere in the world. Um, you don't always have um, uh, availability of these, some of these drugs. It's very much a how-to-use guide for spinal pralocaine and 2-chloroprocaine. Um, and it's got some practical hints and considerations. Here's a recent article for reference, uh, which uh, uh, Will headed up. Um, it has all the references in it. So if you want to find somewhere to find all the references, this is probably the place to go and it's available um, in the literature. So the pandemic and regional anesthesia, there is a re an increased regional anesthesia interest. We know that. Um, I think it's good. Um, some people might not. Um, I believe you have to be a little bit careful uh, rushing into doing regional anesthesia when it's not something you're particularly well trained in or uh, you're, you're, um, or practice that might be a, a disadvantage. But I think generally it's a good idea and people are more interested in it. There are GA risks. This has been talked about, the staff, patient, and possibly the anaesthetist. Um, there's a lack of theater efficiency, which uh, Will commented on, both Wills have commented on, um, and um, uh, a use of a lot of PP, and this can be avoided with regional anesthesia. One area that's not been mentioned so much by anybody is the effect on the recovery area or the post-anesthetic care unit staff. I think they're really at quite a high risk. You've got patients going there after general anesthesia who uh, are unable to stop themselves coughing for some reason and, um, and while they're waking up. And I, I think certainly they feel more at risk and this has been an issue in our hospital. And I think regional anesthesia is a benefit here too. And then there's patient involvement, which uh, uh, Will mentioned as well, um, and perhaps less follow-ups. So spinals in the UK, interestingly enough, in the uh, awareness study years ago, 75% of patients who were supposed to be awake um, for awake surgery in the UK were done under spinal anesthesia. That's 75% of all regional anesthesia. It is the commonest and simplest regional anesthetic. It's still underused. Uh, an observational study from Guys and Thomases, which uh, Amit was involved with, just very recently, um, when they looked at emergency surgery done during COVID, um, 46% of their regional anaesthetics were spinal anaesthetics. Spinals are a basic competency for all anaesthetists. Everybody can do a spinal. They have a low failure rate. They're highly effective operative analgesics. And they're suitable for all types of um, infraumbilical surgery, I would say. So I'm going to look at the evolution of spinal anaesthesia from the 1990s to the 2020s very quickly, just to, uh, as illustrated by um, uh, knee arthroplasty surgery. And I think they go hand in hand to illustrate it. So back in the 1990s um, in Derby, we used spinal bupivacaine. Uh, we used an epidural for post-op pain, fantastic analgesia, long length of stay, uh, you know, eight, seven, 10 days. Um, and the patients had a catheter, an intravenous line, very heavy legs, it made physio difficult. Um, and um, uh, there were problems associated with that, certainly not an enhanced recovery regime. We moved on. In the 2000s, we used spinal bupivacaine still, um, and then we, we went for femoral and sciatic blocks and dropped the epidural. 
a fantastic analgesia, slightly shorter length of stay, still had a catheter, still had an intravenous line, and uh, they had a very heavy leg, which made, again, active physio a lot harder. Uh, in the 2010s, the concept of enhanced recovery came in, and we started to use what we call analgesic spinals. So this is a low-dose bupivacaine spinal with some opioid in, usually in the UK, fentanyl. Um, we used um, local infiltration anesthesia for pain relief afterwards, and often they had a propofol infusion, which has just been alluded to. And I think this is often used because the low-dose bupivacaine spinal might not have been quite adequate for the surgery, certainly for hip surgery, where it's, uh, it, it is higher and less easy to catch. So where are we in the future from now on? Well, I'm starting to look towards using more normal volume spinal anesthetics. So using normal volumes of the correct spinal to suit the length of the operation, using pralocaine for a lot of these procedures and even chloroprocaine for some uh, quicker day case knee replacements. We're using local infiltration analgesia for post-op pain. And I know this is one of the questions somebody asked, um, uh, what do we use to take over from the spinal? And this is absolutely fundamental for the management of low-dose spinals, and uh, uh, sorry, low, short-acting spinals. Um, we use femoral triangle blocks or adductor canal blocks. Um, some use IPAC blocks. Um, and I would question, as this has been alluded to already, the need for sedation. Um, there are other ways of managing patients who are anxious. Um, they may receive a small dose of a, of a um, benzodiazepine um, prior to the spinal, but often once uh, they're settled in theatre, they might not need any sedation. Um, you can talk to them. Patients are very interesting people and, um, and always fascinating. So how we do it? Well, we've got three choices essentially in the UK. We're very lucky. We've got low dose bupivacaine, uh, plus or minus an opioid for pain relief and um, maybe to help with the uh, low dose of bupivacaine. We've got hyperbaric pralocaine, and we've got isobaric 1% chloroprocaine. I think bupivacaine may be too much for a lot of anesthesia. You get heavy legs. Retention is a significant risk for these patients. Uh, opioids cause pruritus um, very commonly, particularly fentanyl, even in low dose. They can have a delayed discharge, which is very frustrating for your day case staff. And I think you should avoid it, if at all possible, for procedures, procedures less than 120 minutes. So the principle is, if a three-hour GA is too long for a 60-minute procedure, I would say a three-hour spinal is also too long for a 60-minute procedure. So your spinal has to suit the procedure. And we're mainly talking here about pralocaine and 2-chloroprocaine. These are game changers. They've made a real difference to us, uh, in, certainly in Derby. I think they're starting to change around the country. So heavy pralocaine, it's widely used in Europe for over 10 years. Sadly, not in the US or Australasia. Um, it'd be lovely if they could have it. Um, it's of intermediate spinal duration. It's licensed for 90 minutes of actual surgical time. I don't know if that includes the time from the spinal going into going into theater, which can be quite long. It certainly gives you 90 minutes of surgical time. But I have found in practice that for particularly knee, foot and ankle surgery, you can get up to 120 minutes of analgesia with this particular drug. I would say just be careful for hip surgery, which involves higher dermatomes, and you might have more of a problem with this. But certainly 90 minutes is very achievable. So the hyperbaric property allows for manipulation of height of the block, which is really handy with prilocaine, and I'll show you how that works shortly. Um, there's evidence of increased cardiovascular stability compared with bupivacaine, and this has been shown in, in um, elective lower segment cesarean section. It fills the gap between bupivacaine and chloroprocaine beautifully, and it allows day case surgery without the need for intrathecal opioid. So what about chloroprocaine? Well, this is isobaric. It's been used in the UK since 2013, um, and Europe for longer. It's been licensed in the US too since 2018, although they have used it off license for many years there. It is of short duration. It's licensed for 40 minutes of actual surgical time. But I find, particularly when doing knee and ankle surgery, you can get up to 60 to 80 minutes out of this drug. Again, a little bit careful with hip surgery, which does require a higher block for, a bit for, for, for achievement of good surgery. So I'd be more careful there. 
it's less easy to manipulate the height. Um, I would say it rarely goes above T10 for that long, um, but there'd be no case reports of urinary retention. And the patients feel better. They don't get that sort of perineal uh, lag that sometimes patients get with the heavy drugs. This is all about targeting your spinal to suit the procedure and the surgeon. And I asked certain pragmatic questions when I take an approach to decision making about these drugs. My first question is, do you just need a saddle block? Uh, this afternoon, I was doing an emergency list. We had a patient with a, a perianal um, uh, infection, uh, an abscess, and a saddle block was ideal. If you don't need a saddle block, do you require a very high block? For instance, if you're doing epigastric hernia repair, it's a day case under spinal. Should you not require a block really above T10 for any particular reason? The next question is, how long is the procedure going to take? If it's very short or is it intermediate? No opioids are particularly required with these drugs um, and they're not licensed for use with these drugs. And I would say that what we're dealing with here is a peroperative analgesic spinal only for the operation as you do with the GA. But it's really, really important point. You must remember that you must think about following on with a regional block of some sort or multimodal analgesia to take over from your spinal when it wears off. Remember, spinals are not there for post-op pain relief. They're there for the operation. And you must think about what to do afterwards. So this is our aid memoir for the anesthetic room. This is what we published in our article. Um, it's, it's a version I designed back in 2015. It's a great help when you're starting to use these drugs in the anaesthetic room uh, for colleagues. Um, it stops them phoning you up every five minutes and asking you what you use for what. So it's very handy. There is a version in the Synthetica booklet and also in the B. Braun literature. Um, so the initial question is, do you want a saddle block? In which case, use a small dose of pralocaine and the patient can be ambulatory very soon afterwards. Extremely effective. If you want a block above T10, use a good dose of pralocaine, uh, using its hyperbaric nature to achieve what you want to achieve. If you don't want a block above T10, it comes down to how long it's going to take. And I would say an hour is a pretty good way of, of dividing the two drugs off. So if it's greater than an hour, I choose pralocaine. And if it's less than an hour, I choose chloroprocaine. And this is the sort of decision that we're making every single day. So how does it translate to a typical theatre session? So this is your low dose bupivacaine with opioid, the traditional approach, um, an arthroscopy using bupivacaine, uh, um, an ACL with bupivacaine, and a total knee with bupivacaine. This may be using low dose bupivacaine, but they still get a very long time to block regression. But the surgical time, as you see, does not really suit the length of the spinal anesthetic. So this is what we see when we get a targeted approach. You're using chloroprocaine for your arthroscopies, uh, a much shorter regression time, much quicker ambulation, much happier day case staff, much happier patient. The ACL, you might use pralocaine. We're moving on with this and some of them are getting chloroprocaine and I'll talk about that. And the knee replacement at the time was still getting bupivacaine. But again, the spinal suits the length of the procedure. So if you're a first time user, I would say, follow the guidelines on the decision making chart. It really helps to get things started. They are guidelines, you'll develop them with time. Try pralocaine first if you're a bit unsure about using these drugs to get yourself confident and, and be generous. Remember, these are low, they're not low dose drugs, but they're short acting drugs. So the concept of low dose anesthesia for a lot of these drugs, unless you're just doing a perineal block, is no longer there. So give a decent dose, but of the correct drug. Don't bother with opioids. They're not licensed and I don't think they're particularly necessary. And also know your surgeon and your surgeon and expand your use as you become more confident with these drugs. So in Derby, for instance, over five years, we've done actually now more than this, but we did a study with 625 knee arthroscopies, uh, 20 to 80 minutes spinal to dressing time, uh, very low failure rate. That's probably just um, uh, technical failure more than anything else. Uh, and no GA conversions and no urinary problems and very popular with patients. So a quick bit on what do I choose? Well, know your surgery, know your surgeon. It's really important uh, to be part of the team. Um, when you have your WHO meeting at the beginning of the day, chat about what you're going to do, find out what the surgeon's going to do, and tell him you're going to use a short tracking drug and he needs to be in theatre operating, or she. So for a simple ACL, if you're just doing an allograft, two chloroprocaine might be entirely appropriate. But if the, if the, if the procedure is a little more complicated, you have to think about maybe 
um, using prilocaine if there's a lateral tenodesis or meniscal repair that might take longer. Angle fixation like I did on Sunday. So if it's just a lateral fixation only or a medial screw only, 2-chloroprocaine could be ideal. More complex, choose prilocaine. As I said, for perianal or perineal surgery, a saddle block uh, is all you need. And I would choose half a mil of prilocaine for its porosity. Extremely effective for all forms of surgery in this area. Ingle and hernia, very common operation. If it's bilateral or large, choose prilocaine. If it's unilateral, you can use 2-chloroprocaine. If you're doing umbilical hernias, it's a great operation to do uh, under spinal, um, very effective. Uh, ureteric stents, again, um, very effective under spinal. But you really need to choose quite a high dose of prilocaine, so its baricity takes advantage of its ability to, to get higher. So recent advances, well, hemiarthroplasty, dynamic hip screw, I'm using prilocaine for most of these patients now, uh, very effective. Uh, it's a quick onset. I would say it's cardiovascularly more stable. Uh, hip screws to chloroprocaine. And remember, they get a less prolonged sympathetic block in recovery. And this can be really handy when you are not with the patient in recovery uh, and they need their blood pressure managed. I think these patients really benefit from that. So going forward, um, uni knee arthroplasty or simple knee arthroplasty, I would often use two chloroprocaine. Um, a trickier knee arthroplasty, perhaps prilocaine. A primary total hip, I would still tend to use um, bupivacaine. Um, at the moment. But if you've got a very slim patient, a particularly fast surgeon, I think prilocaine is extremely effective and I've used this quite a lot. This is my trauma list. This is real anesthesia from Sunday afternoon this week. Um, a short femoral nail, cannulated hip screw, uh, tibial spanning X fix, uh, washout of a knee laceration and a fixation of an ankle. And you can see I used prilocaine for the first one, Ampress, uh, sorry, chloroprocaine, prilocaine for the third, uh, chloroprocaine for the, for the fourth and prilocaine for the fifth case. Uh, you can see I've written some blocks down as well. I always make sure that, uh, that I have a block in place to take over from my spinal when it wears off. And those are the lengths of surgery we achieve. Some were done by trainees and some are done by the consultant. So this is real life. So why is spinal anesthesia the efficient choice? Well, a lot of this has been discussed. Uh, there's no aerosol generating procedure, increased safety for everybody. It's time saving and it's low cost. I think you should offer sedation if appropriate. Uh, why not? And allow the patient to change their mind at any time. If they want to be sedated and you haven't done it before, make them part of the team, make them part of the decision making. And I think this is really fun. Match your spinal to the procedure. They can keep their dentures in. I know this may sound like a small thing. For a lot of patients, it's really, really important. They can drink clear fluids till they come to theater. I even give them fluid to drink in theater. Um, Patients may observe the procedure or discuss treatment with the surgeon uh, and perhaps avoid a follow-up visit too. Uh, there's no wake-up time or air removal time in theatre. I think it's safer for particularly for your recovery and PACU staff um, and they have a shorter recovery stay. They rapidly mobilise and they discharge quickly. So in summary, spinal anesthesia is the non-regionalists regional. We can all do it. It's simple, it's safe, it's effective and it's efficient. And thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. <laughs> Robbie, thank you very much. That was excellent. As uh, as you might imagine, uh, there have been a ridiculous number of questions that have come through. Uh, and in interest of keeping the webinar moving, I won't ask all of them. Uh, one very um, quick question for some of our colleagues who may not be aware of it. What's an IPAC block, please? Oh, there we are. So this stands for in between popliteal artery and capsule of knee. So it's an ultrasound guided. Uh, very peripheral um, analgesic um, motor sparing block of the posterior capsule of the knee. So it's, it's where the supply comes into the back of the knee, which provides pain relief for a lot of knee surgery. Highly effective. It's been a real game changer for me in major knee surgery in the last couple of years. A massive difference, massive difference. Uh, and when you talk about low dose bupivacaine, how low is low dose bupivacaine? Oh, I'm probably talking, um, 1.5 mil to half percent so that's what um um where are we now that's about 7.5 milligrams or less i would say it's a, it's a difficult one to, to be precise about because different people have different views but i would say i pay probably one point um, uh, um sorry 7.5 7.25 milligrams is probably what i'm talking about yeah uh, and have you any experience with diluting bupivacaine with saline diluting it down i never add anything to it. Um, I think there's a potential for error here. I think there's a potential for infection. Um, I think it's unnecessary. Um, I think I know a lot of people do this. 
but I think the, the effect is perhaps far better, more dependent on how fast you inject or the position you put the patient in. Um, certainly. Okay. But final no. question when should i act um opioids to my short acting spinal yeah that's a good one um as i mentioned i don't think it's necessary um 95 percent of the time there is one exception to that and that is when i'm doing a uh, pelvic surgery for instance um vaginal hysterectomy pelvic repair that sort of thing or um when i want a short acting spinal uh, but i want some post-op pain relief i would add diamorphine that's my drug of choice but that's not really there to improve your spinal it's there to provide you with post-operative pain relief uh, um, uh, uh, for, the, for the for these patients. So that's when I'd use it. Otherwise, I don't bother anymore. I really don't bother. Robbie, thank you very much for an excellent talk.